it's uh, also a nice combination. We've been to the French lot area where you can also find the Resel for diving. Uh, we've been there last year, uh, the last year October, and we uh, we combined dry caving and then sump diving. Off gassing a scuba podcast with host Nick Hogel. In this episode, I speak with underwater photographer Frank Aaron. After being introduced to scuba diving in the south of France, Frank eventually found his way to overhead environments. He became CAVE certified in Mexico, moving on to spend time in the mines of Germany and France. Challenges of photography in flooded mines, developing a passion for dry caving, enjoying a nice red wine, becoming a family of divers, and much more. Please enjoy. Frank, how are you doing this morning? Yes, fine, thank you. Unfortunately, I suffered from a flu two weeks ago and my voice is still a little bit lacking, but um, I think it should work very well this morning. And uh, well, I'm expecting um, Easter in the next time and then we are going for mine diving. I'm really looking forward to that um, because um, well, we want to take some more pictures in the Felicitas mine nearby and... Yes, it should be a nice, um, a nice trip to go. Oh, okay, okay, cool. Well, I'm, I'm excited to hear more about that. Well, um, just real quick, the flu is it, it? Was there something going around? Did you just catch something? Um, I know, I, I, like, the, it's kind of. I know it varies sometimes depending on on how people caught the flu. But was there something going around? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. I'm. Um, uh, well, on my main job, I'm working in the pharmaceutical industry and um, I have to contact uh, doctors and medics and um, probably I'm um, caught that somewhere in a, in a, in a clinic in a hospital. Um, to be honest, I have no idea where I caught it, but uh, it started with, with uh, fever uh, for a couple of days and uh, well, what's the last thing is, is my voice still lacking in a way, but that's the whole story. It's a usual uh, usual um, uh, winter problem here in middle of Europe, and well, I'm familiar with that every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> again yeah. And again. Um, well, I'm I'm glad that you're feeling better, and I'm excited that you're on the podcast. I uh, look forward to hearing about your journey. And my my first question I usually ask, I like to ask, is tell me about that path into scuba diving. Tell me about that first breath underwater. Uh, what led to that moment? Was it love at first breath? Was it I hate this, I'm never doing this again? Tell me all about it. <laughs> yes, thank you for your wishes. And yes, it was my father. Um, he dived in the 1960s as a rescue diver in Germany in the northern in the Baltic Sea. And uh, we, we've been to the Mediterranean every summer to the south of France for diving. And uh, I think it was um, in 1986 when I started diving, taking a um, uh, diving class in, in uh, south of France. I think it was a CMAS um, facility. Well, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, it, that, that caught me. You, you can see lots of fishes. You see this, this uh, blue water around and it can move in the third dimension. It's, it's fantastic. And, well, since 1987, I started becoming a member of a local diving club. And since that time, I'm, I'm frequently diving sometimes every week. And, and it's... it's Real fun. It's something to to really come down as a weekend um, from your from your week from your working week. Okay, okay. Well, so when you first started diving, you said that you took your first initial classes in France. Yes. How how was the diving there? Yes, it's a Mediterranean Sea, the Pyrenees near the frontier to Spain, and um, it was fantastic. You see. The blue water, 20 meters of visibility, um, lots of very nice colored fishes. It's it's a fantastic experience. And um, when you compare this, even the situation of some lakes or in Germany or even to the North Sea, it's um, it's a real jump. It's very nice to be there. It's warm water, and then you feel like being on holiday. And uh, yeah, that's that's a nice nice stuff, nice nice place to be. So the the initial training was warm water. When did you kind of start to transition over into the colder water diving? <laughs> yes, a year, uh, a year after. It was um, uh, 
Yes, in 1987, when I started um, uh, becoming a member of this diving club, and you have to usually you can't go every time from Germany to France for diving. It's um, one and a, one and a half thousand kilometers to go, and you have to look what's available in Germany, northern part of Germany. They have some lakes which are so and so. Uh, when you look uh, outside in the winter, you have water temperatures of around four degrees centigrade and low visibilities and well you have to really um, uh, motivate it to go in the water but um, what I've seen a couple of years ago was that there are some uh, lakes existing man-made lakes um, or quarries which are having even the winter time fantastic visibilities um, better than than um, probably in the, in the Mediterranean Sea they're fantastic to go um, they offer similar conditions as the Mediterranean Mediterranean Sea are just colder to dive, but um, even even this experience of, of seeing blue water, um, having divers below you 20 meters go, um, 10 meters deeper, and um, diving through their uh, air bubbles is uh, just fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So I have not done much cold water diving and it's something that I'm, I'm really, at some point, I, I would like to get into. I know we were kind of joking around earlier just saying oh you know i'm not the biggest fan of the the cold weather but um i I do find that there are some really nice cold water diving areas when you so when you first started i'm assuming it was just like a a wetsuit warm water when you started to have to go into the cold water and you know that gear transition kind of gets people sometimes how did you how did you take to that i mean were you just motivated enough to like hey i'm going to keep going i'm going to keep doing this was there like uh oh i i don't know about this but i'm going to keep pursuing it well it, uh, the, the the dry suit diving became very popular a couple of years after i started diving and uh, first was to do um buy dry suits um to be motivated um, to go in the, even the cold water, even in the winter time, also in the summer, right now. And um, yes, we started diving with wet suits in in four degrees cold water in the winter. That was no fun. <laughs> it was um, horrible. But <laughs> I was younger at that time. That was not not the problem. It was just going in and try to find some fishes and and just have fun for a for half an hour. And afterwards, well, a couple of years later, we, we bought dry suits, which makes it much more comfortable and um, gave you the opportunity to stay in the water for, for even one one hour or for 90 minutes or so. And so it, it, it rose up and became much more um, uh, comfortable and much more technical from this point of view. But it, it works much better and, and gives you the opportunity to, to enjoy the sport, really enjoy even the winter. So... Obviously, you you like the underwater photography, and I also see that you like the overhead environment. Which came first? Were you were you a land, I like to say dry photography, land photography that transitioned into the water, or was it like oh I, I like the the scenes I want to try to capture them. Let me get into photography. And, and which one came first, the overhead environment or the photography? No, the first was uh, photography. I started uh, taking pics with an analog camera in, I guess, in the early 2000s or 1990s. I'm not sure. Took pictures for sport on sports events um, for a sports club. It was my initiation to go to um, to take pictures to be a photographer. Overhead environment came later. I started technical diving in 1998 with with nitrox, the usual way, an INTD way with with nitrox with um, um, deep air and then afterwards the streamix and uh, I've been to to Yucatan to Mexico in 1998 where I took a class in cave diving up to open circuit full cave diving and this was so really that really flashed me that was so fantastic you have this uh, amazing visibility there in the cenotes you have the stalactites hanging there and and what what I really do remember is that you uh, have to be familiar with the overhead situation. Our instructor told us to uh, shut off our lamps and just to, to um, come clear with the situation to make sure you have here this, this guiding line in your hand, but uh, this primary line, but to make sure that you can do you can can deal with the situation without any light around. And um, this was fantastic. That's really great. It was from my 
point of view is one of my best diving classes I've ever taken. And yes, first photography, then um, uh, overhead, and um, afterwards I started combining it in the middle of the 2000s. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, the the first time that you went into an overhead environment, was it excitement? Were you nervous? W what was the feeling like? Do you remember the, the very first time you went in there? First was nervosity, yeah, of course, yes. You are not familiar with the situation. You're familiar with um, uh, German lakes with one meter of visibility, and um, when you're looking up, you can't see nothing, <laughs> even not the sun in this condition and you are probably well a certain kind of familiar with the situation but now you're aware that there's um, massive lines, limestone over your head uh, some water and there's limestone and you have to go back the way you came in irrespective of the conditions um, and then yeah yes of course you are nervous but then it became familiar it was just fun it was a really amazing experience and well this is um uh, situation when you see um, all the stuff hanging around there was just was just great and um, makes you completely um, um, keeping this this uh, nervosity out of out of your mind so I'm, I'm actually about to head to mexico in may i'll be down there in may to start my overhead training and one one question i've been asking people that that have their full cave certifications is so the, the first time that you went out and did an overhead dive outside of the class environment, because I know when you're in a class environment, there's kind of that security of the instructor being there. The you know Obviously, you should be diving in a team, but there's that kind of that, that sense of, I don't want to say safeness, but that security of having you know the, the, the person in charge being not in control of everything. But do you remember the first time that you, you know, went out and you're like, okay, I'm full cave certified. I'm here. We're going to go out. We're going to do our first dive without proper guidance. This is just all on our own. Do you, do you remember that first dive? Yes, I, I do. Yes. It was also <laughs> university um, uh, guided for first minutes. But, well, the first is you, you learned a lot. The, the 10, 10 dives, I think it was 10 dives ago or 14 dives, I don't know. And um, you have all of that stuff you learn ago um, um, in your mind to to be sure that you are doing um, um, a proper dive now and, and to to make sure that you are when you're in a cave um, or in a situation that you that you can deal with it. Um, and uh, yes, it was university. You have to keep that stuff in mind. And um, uh, well, we, we started lying our primary um, line uh, reel to the to the main line and and. As I remember, it was a real um, challenge to find the mainland because they are appropriately hidden to make sure that no sports divers um, are doing uh, cave dives there. And uh, I think we spent around 20 minutes just to find the mainline. The tanks were <laughs> nearly nearly done, <laughs> so it, w it was a very short dive. <laughs> but it was it, it gave us the, the, the opinion, the opportunity to translate the stuff we learned in that, that class into our own mind to to make sure okay that's what we have to take care of when we're starting cave diving next time and the second dive worked much better <laughs> <laughs> so i i also see that you do a lot of mind diving do you remember uh because so t tell me because i know that some people will talk there's the differences i mean i know an overhead environment is an overhead environment but tell me a little bit about the mind diving that you do and the differences between a cave and a mine <laughs> well, to be honest, um, f for me it's very, very similar. You have um, uh, navigation is, is the same, uh, irrespective of your diving. If you're diving in a cave or in a mine, usually you f you find your your main line starting from the surface. You don't have to uh, lay a primary reel because um, the, mine, the access to the mines is very uh, strictly um, regulated uh, for good reasons and. Um, you have this, this uh, construction called Bremsberg, where usually diving down, where the, the, um, uh, the mining goods are um, uh, brought out of the mine in earlier times. And uh, you're diving down there, finding uh, your main line, and then you have the same tees and jumps and the same markers as you can also find them in a, in a cave. Uh, 
the stone is of course different. Here in the northern part of Germany, you will often find slate mines with sometimes fragile, fragile walls. You have to take sometimes take care where you are touching or what you are touching. You have um, old tubes, um, hoses lying around, old stuff, which is very rusty. It gives you this uh, feeling of diving in a wreck. Uh, when you uh, don't take care of your fins, uh, you uh, create a uh, nice visibility uh, like zero <laughs> when the rust is coming down. Navigation is similar, it's the same, but the environment is different. You have um, uh, more of a character of, of uh, wreck diving in open seas and, and um, you just find yourself um, in a mine with a, with a roof on top of you, like in a cave. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. You were saying there's a lot of mines in your area, and they're all regulated. Is there a bunch of mines in certain areas, or are they just spread out? Uh, you can find, well, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, uh, geographical situation in northern Germany. There's um, um, a mountain region called the Sauerland, which is where very many slate mines existing. The whole region, the, the houses are all covered um, the roof of slate and um, there's a lot of slate um, being mined in the past centuries you find um, even this um, region which is one and a half hours south of my my hometown i think four mines four slate mines where you can go diving so it's, it's um, a very nice place to go for for mine diving and there are some uh, some more mines in the eastern part of germany um, such as miltitz near to Dresden, or um, I think near to, there's one more mine near to Chemnitz, the eastern part of Germany. So there's, altogether there's six mines to go mine diving here in Germany. If you had a preference, do you like mines more than caves or caves over mines? <laughs> well, uh, that depends. Um, uh, what I like, even from my point of view as a photographer, what I really m like is uh, to to have well, very structured walls. You can find these in mines. You have this this um, slate uh, shifts on the side walls and on the, on the top, and you can. But you can also find very interesting structures and in big rooms in French caves when you go to the French Rassel. You have this big shaft going down from 30 to 45 meter, which is really huge. And, um, and even maybe in the summertime with fantastic visibilities. And you also have this, this coral-like structures in the deeper parts of the Russell and the walls. It's really um, sharp edges and, and um, it's looking very nice. And then this gives you also a nice view as a photographer on this, um, on this side. Speaking of the the photography, what what do you shoot with? It's a um, uh, full frame camera. It's a Sony A7. See, it's not a camera housing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you always uh, uh, shot with Sony? Yes, I'm doing so for ten years now. Please don't ask me why. <laughs> 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 I I do really not remember. I just uh, I, I think my father started taking pics with with Sony and. This is, um, the menu was was nice to handle. It was easy, and you find everything you uh, you are looking for, even when you're diving deep down. And, and well, it should be easy to handle, and that's that's given with a Sony. Okay, okay. <laughs> not to make not to make um, advertising here, <laughs> but that's a nice point. <laughs> no, 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 for sure. Actually, um, so I I am a Sony fan, but at the same time, I've only ever shot with Sony. I I don't do any underwater photography. I I. I you know, like I was saying, I do dry photography as just a strictly hobby. But I, I started with Sony A7R2 that I got secondhand. And then in late 2022, I picked up the uh, A7 IV, which I'm kind of on the like, I've been on the fence. I'm like, man, I really, sh I, I really want to start to get into underwater photography. But it, you know, it's just the one, I'm kind of scared to just bring the camera in the water. But two, I mean, I'm sure you know, it just adds a whole nother aspect to your diving. So it's not just like, oh, me diving now. It's like, okay, now I have this camera. And, and I guess that will lead to my to my next question. What are some challenges that you deal with as a photographer going into these overhead environments? <laughs> well, it's... um. I think it should be it should be real fun. Um, um, well, um, 
my my way of taking pics is um, going d for a dive there in the mine, looking for some special aspects, as mentioned, the structure of the walls and maybe the size of, of a room of space. The next is um, that I'm, I'm making a plan on a on a leaflet together with my model to, to make a real, well, let's say, a choreography of, of how a picture could look like. And I've seen many pics of, of Alex Dawson, who takes fantastic pics in, in uh, mines with um, backlight, with video lights, without any flashes. And I think that that's really a nice thing to do. That's, that's my way of, of taking pics. And um, I started buying some high-level um, video lights with um, about 60,000 lumen which can give you a good backlight. Um, you don't have to use flashes and hope that your slave flashes um, are also um, starting flashing. That's sometimes a challenge with, with uh, slave flashes. But with video lights, you can hang this, lay these video lights or hang them up wherever you want to b um, do them. You can correct um, your image and uh, Nexus that your model has to be in the right place. Your <laughs> sometimes my model Petra. I hope she doesn't worry about me, but I sometimes take her out her on her um, double twelve on her back and then move her to the place, a push her really uh, underwater where I want to have her. <laughs> and then afterwards, I'm swimming to my to the point where I want to take my pick. So and, and then you start taking 10, 20, 30 picks of that uh, one scenery and then. After the dive, you start um, collecting and then look what's the best image and what's the image uh, which, can, which can be used from the situation. I, I've actually heard that, and I, I want to say that that seems to be kind of a common practice now. Instead of using strobes, a lot more people will use video lights just because, like some of the things that you were saying. So that, that seems like it's become quite common practice. Am, am I right in saying that? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Are many people using visual lights right now. Yes, they are getting very strong and and very powerful and well, it's appropriate. Just because you could set the light and you don't have to time it like 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 a, a traditional flash, I guess, or a strobe. Is that is that's what you would call it? Um, the point is that uh, the first point for me is uh, you 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 can see what you get. You're hanging up your your video lights um, on your um, maybe um, under the roof uh, with with some some. Um, boys to make sure that it's getting upwards and uh, you uh, you can see what you get even when you have nice wall structures you can create shadows on the wall with a video light placing appropriate behind your model to give your model you can make a silhouette of your model when this video light is hanging behind your model and then you have as mentioned this is um, shadows on the wall you have nice um, uh, light beams coming um, around your model coming into, into your direction. The point is just that you have to place your model appropriate and that's a very nice thing um, for me is it gives some uh, real depth to the to the image, a, a certain kind of, of third dimension perspective. Well, let's say it like this and that's um, that's something very nice. And well, I'm using, I don't use strobes or flashes for, for two or three years now. And then you're, you were saying on a on a typical photo shoot you're you're taking about 20 or 30 photos do you try to limit so i know like just i'm relating everything to dry photography but when i first got the camera i was a very trigger happy person so i'm i'm just you know i go out i try to shoot some some photos i come back with like over 100 images um and then i'm sorting through and i'm like okay i i need to start to limit the number of images. So is that what, like, do you have a set number every time you go out? Like, okay, I'm, I'm only going to try to take 20 or 30, or do you go out sometimes you're taking 50 and then out of those 50, are you only kind of getting a few shots that you like? Well, it really depends on the situation. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm um, um, replacing my model sometimes, probably replace my video lights and uh, usually uh, do HDR photography, so my my camera is set on on taking serial pics uh, from one scenery with was um, uh, was a change in in your your um, uh, aperture time or things like this. And um, uh, this, uh, this is a nice tool in Photoshop existing where three of these pics uh, with with um, different um, settings can be counted to one together. 
to make make one photo with which is which has no no problems with with um, too much light or too too harsh shadows, and it really depends. Um, usually, uh, when I'm leaving the water, there are 100 to 200 uh, uh, pics more on my camera. Um, it's it's two years old, and I guess it's um, two and a half years in a, so a nine or ten thousand images now on the counter. Oh, okay, okay. To, to give you just a uh, picture. <laughs> On the, the editing side of it, typically, like, so you, you come back, you have your images, now you're selecting your images. How generally, how long does it kind of take you to, to produce the final product? Well, usually two or three hours, something like this. Depends on on what's what's necessary in in uh, processing, and as you I usually reduce the noise on the photo, um, uh, also the dust, regulating down the light, um, so that you have an uh, image which is um, where many more structures can be seen as as uh, compared to what you can see on your uh, on your camera itself. Um, well, three or four hours, something like this. Mm. That that's actually uh, one thing that was the the probably the most challenging and still kind of for me and and I I like I just got back from a trip I have a little GoPro um, basically and I'll try to edit you know to try to bring the colors back or or you know scale back on some colors and I, that that's definitely one thing that I kind of stumble upon or, or stumble on I should say is the editing side of it because I'm always I feel like I'm doing too much or not enough I, I just haven't found that happy balance yet so that's why I, I, I love chatting with photographers just to kind of pick their brain and be like hey can you give me some <laughs> tips like you know what 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 are some things that will make this a little bit easier for me <laughs> uh, just because yeah it could be uh, uh, quite tough sometime. Well, to be honest, I'm also looking for um, opportunities to make it easier. <laughs> Until now, I, I did not find them. <laughs> so do you have a, 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 a favorite mine that you like to go shoot? Or do you have certain spots in different mines? Like, is there one that you find yourself going back to more to try to capture images? Well, some different mines. It's a Felicitas mine here in in. Uh, in the northern part of the Sauerland, uh, where I can find a great space where uh, some some um, uh, caterpillars have been left. Oh. When the mine was through, that's a nice place to go. And uh, you, um, I think it's a space of a size like like 30 meters in length and, and uh, 20 meters in width. And it's about 10 meters high and, and uh, standing two or three caterpillars down there. And um, even even uh, this to to uh, capture the structure of this great space with this caterpillar staying there, it's uh, nice to go there. And and um, well, after that you find some saw blades um, sticking in the walls there in this mine, and it's also a challenge to um, to get in advance um, into your brain and uh, thinking about light positioning to to make sure that you can uh, your model into saw blades. Um, uh, bring appropriate on your picture but yes it's felicitas mine it's uh for the moment it's my favorite mine i've actually I, I don't know why i haven't thought of this question before but so when you go out and and you're typically you're, you're doing a mine diving does it get overcrowded like is there a lot of people trying to squeeze in for the weekend or or the time that you're there or is it typically like a pretty uh, uh isolated you know maybe one or two other divers there uh, as mentioned before, it, it's regulated, so the, the, the um, owners um, are very strictly looking on how many people can can uh, can get in there, can can um, be uh, registered for for diving for it, uh, for a specific day, and I think there's this not as more as 10, 10 or twelve um, uh, divers for a weekend there. So you have enough space. You are sometimes meeting some divers, but you are often you're on, on your own with your with your buddy. Um, and it's not as, as overcrowded as you can find it probably on, on <laughs> diving trips in the Red Sea or similar. The, the, they only allow certain certain amount of people in there. So when you mm -hmm. dive, you, you have to like call ahead and, and schedule your spot, like reserve your spot to say like, oh, okay, I'm, you know, bringing four people with me this weekend. Is that kind of how it works out? 
Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. Hmm. It's a um, uh, kind of um, uh, web page existing where you can register yourself, uh, where you can register your buddies, and you have to show your your full cave uh, certification. So everything um, is, is known to the owners, and and you have a great uh, slate um, wall where you're writing your time when you're getting in, and also your time when you leave the water, so that they can see everyone's out of the water when they are leaving the evening. What's a typical uh, uh, length time that you'll spend in the mine? Well, it's usually it's between um, 80, 80 and 100 minutes, maybe 110, 120, but that's the limit. You find um, uh, temperature, temperatures of around 8 degrees. We are diving on, on uh, CCRs where you can breathe your own warmed up air, but, but also after two hours it gets cold. And even with, with electrical heating, uh, <laughs> two hours is okay, and, and that's it. <laughs> you know that uh, upstairs is a warm coffee waiting for you, <laughs> and that's okay then. <laughs> and I'm just curious, what, what unit... Do you dive with? Uh, it's, um, uh, at the moment, I'm diving a T rep and uh, on side mount and um, uh, AP diving uh, inspiration, old inspiration, which is modified to kiss. Oh. But works very well. Yeah. Okay, so you have you have your you, you dive dual rebreathers. No, just um, uh, back mount situation is on the inspiration and the side mount situation is um, on the T-Rep. Depends on what you're planning to do when you have shallow areas in your cave or your mine, you're going side mount. And when you need um, more open circuit bailout tanks, you should go back mount. It depends on the situation, what you're planning to do. So uh, uh, do you generally stick to mines? Do you do uh, another question I always like to ask, like, do you ever find yourself doing like the holiday single tank back mount, just warm water diving or, <laughs> cause I know some people, once they make that transition, they, they're like, you know, this is the diving for me. I don't want to do that other diving. Do you, do you still do the, the recreational single tank stuff? Uh, yes, uh, I do. <laughs> and um, uh, to my great luck, I have to uh, next summer because my son, he's, he's 17 years old, uh, wants to start diving, wants to start scuba diving, sports diving in the summer. And, and I hope that we will find afterwards the opportunity. Of course, in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the, on an Italian island, of course, I hope we'll find the opportunity to go you, the normal way of scuba diving as a family, together with my wife and my son, and just uh, looking fishes, enjoying the warm water, and, and diving down to to maximum 10, 12, or 50 meters or similar. Oh, okay, okay. So he, he is not certified, but he wants to become certified. Yes, next summer. Oh, okay, okay. Is that just because he sees you and the stuff that you're doing, or, or what, what brought that up for him? <laughs> Well, I hope that he's doing that self-motivated, but uh, I think <laughs> he sees uh, things that I'm doing. We are um, both of us um, uh, dry cavers, uh, speleologists, so we are often going to France for dry caving. Um, he also got infected by the by my cave virus, which is also spread to dry caves, and, and there he's very, very um, killed um, uh, climber in, in case and i think he also saw that that diving could also scuba diving could also be a nice stuff for him to do and well i'm really glad that um, he's doing that and i don't know whether he's doing that because i taught him or self-motivated but in a way no that's it's, awesome. it's nice to see that he wants to go with me <laughs> yeah no that's awesome um so i'm just kind of getting into the cave side of things i have not done any dry caving it's something that i want to do here in malaysia there's there's a lot of dry caves when you're dry caving do you do like any sump diving or is it just strictly dry caving no no it's it's uh, also a nice combination we've been to the french lot area where you can also find the resell for diving uh, we've been there last year uh, the last year october and we we combined dry caving and and sump diving we uh, we were a team of three and um, have let down um, a couple of um, small tanks, seven liter tanks, uh, wet suit um, equipment, side mount equipment down, uh, I think it was 110 meters down into um, in front of a sump and there we were able to drive the first sump of the, uh, it's called Igue, Igue de la Plana Grise in France, 
Well, with crystal clear water, you know that you are the only one diving there, and and it's just nice to to start such a project to to plan this project. Uh, you know, you have three three people and this whole big amount of stuff to be putting down there in front of the sump. And afterwards, you are performing this three days project um, uh, to bring stuff down to go diving, and on the third day, you bring the whole stuff uh, up and and. Uh, be, just be glad about it. Everything has worked, and and um, yeah, everything was fine. It really, I really do really enjoy this. Oh, okay. Were did, were you a, a dry caver before starting to go into the overhead environment, or did it kind of happen afterwards? No, that happened afterwards. Oh, okay. I started um, uh, cave diving in 1998, as mentioned, and we. Well, the story was we we've been to um, to the lot for cave diving in. I don't know, I think it was 2005 or similar. Uh, we've seen that there are a lot of dry caves, um, even this is kind of um, very vertical cave where you have um, pits of, of 100 meter um, going straight down. And we've seen that and we, we really f- uh, flashed by this and we, we just were aware, okay, that's uh, that's our next hobby. <laughs> Although we have to learn that and yeah. Okay. So we started in 2006, I guess. It was 2006 where we started doing dry caving. Okay. So, and you're saying when there's these huge pitches and you're dry caving, like you're bringing ropes, you're, you're, you know, I don't know the proper term for it, but uh, um, like rappelling down stuff, climbing up stuff. Is is that a typical dry caving day? Yes, that's it. Yes. Oh, okay. You're taking, um, you, you will find uh, the, the, Plants of this caves everywhere in the, the World Wide Web. Um, the French um, speleology group is, is very, very. Um, plants are very well um, available on the internet, and you can go there, um, look when there's no one else um, climbing there. You can hang in your 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 ropes, and and go down and have fun and just go climbing. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, it's something that that I I need to try to get into if if. You were to have a preference, would it be dry caving or or wet caving? I don't know if that's the proper term. For it. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> well, in France, it's it's a red wine afterwards. No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's um, well, it really depends on on what you're doing, uh, what you want to do. When you have uh, good um, weather conditions, no currents in the the um, wet mines and water fluted mines. Or in the, the caves, um, I usually prefer um, uh, cave diving. It's just um, uh, f- great to to um, dive down these pits and sh- shafts. And then, well, when it sh- should be uh, something more sportive, um, you're you're really um, uh, you have to be um, very sportive to do do dry caving because you have to climb up 100 meter. When you want to um, uh, enjoy this aspect, you go dry caving. Even when it when there was heavy rainfall, when you go can't go uh, cave diving, then you will choose um, uh, dry caving much more often possible. But you have just to take care of of um, places where sumps can be fluted by the rain, so you have to make sure uh, that that ca- cannot happen to you when you're down there in a dry cave. Okay, it, do you have any? Um, uh like dry caving dream destinations like like uh so what kind of sparked my interest was um so there's two caves in the 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 south east asia area there's one in in uh, uh like sabah borneo area that i feel like used to be one of the biggest caves i can't remember the name of it um but then there was another one in vietnam that Looks amazing. I actually ended up watching a documentary. I think it's the biggest cave in the world. It, uh, I've seen pictures of this. Yeah. Yeah. It looks. San Dong Hong or yeah. similar. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, do you like? Do you have any plans to do some dry cavings like internationally, or do you just kind of stick stick to your area? Well, it um, primarily it's it's its area here around. The, the point is that you have to uh, bring a lot of stuff with you. Uh, which you cannot um, bring when you're going by aircraft somewhere around. Yes, it's even a problem when you're going to somewhere for 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 diving. And um, well, even even France or even some some places in Germany are very very nice to go there, where you can find um, whatever you need um, there around. What's probably interesting would be um, uh, cave diving, but diving not not climbing, not dry caving. 
would be Florida. That's a nice place to go. I've never been there and I've seen pictures of um, eagles' nests. So it's, it's really interesting to go. But for dry caving, um, I really would uh, prefer and recommend France and because you find fantastic uh, caves there. There's um, a traverse existing where going down in the French Jura region in the, um, in the eastern part of France, where going down into a cave, um, you can uh, go um, under the earth for, for 18 kilometers or similar and get up on another place. Uh, and and um, this is a, usually it's a, a 30 hours trip um, to do that where you need excellent weather conditions. But um, I think we, we are going to do some dry caving in this um, cave, just just a part of this, this cave, not the whole cave. I think I'm too old for, do, for doing that, but... <laughs> um, just a part, there are great halls under the air, under the earth, and, and uh, this is something I have to really, um, I have to see. Some of these caves, I actually, I don't, I don't really know, but uh, you're you saying that it takes 30 hours to do, so you're, you're going down there and you're staying for the night and then continuing to traverse, is, is, that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what other groups do. I don't think that this is my... Um, uh, kind of understanding. Um, we are usually doing um, uh, trips on a daily basis, um, maximum of 12, 14 hours. That's it. And uh, well, as mentioned, I'm, I'm also lucky to, to have my glass of red wine afterwards. When I'm up again. <laughs> <laughs> so I never slept in a cave. Well, well, why not? Maybe we should discuss this in our team. <laughs> but usually it's, it's this kind of, of one day trip. Um, and in the evening you are uh, exhausted enough to have a nice meal and then go to bed and that's it for that day. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, uh, that the glass of wine or, or for me, the, the beer afterwards, I always say that's, that's my, that's when the real that's deco it, yeah. begins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. Man. I just have a, a last couple questions for you and then I'll, I'll let mm-hmm. you go. So I always kind of like to end it on, on some sort of advice question and, and, and this one, you know, generally it'll always kind of be something that I'm curious about. But as far as photography, as someone that is looking to get into photography, underwater photography, what is some of the best pieces of advice that you could give to that person who wants to bring the camera and capture underwater images? Well, <laughs> Difficult question. <laughs> I think, um, first of all, you should be aware of what what you want to show in your, your picture. Do you want to take pics of, of your nice buddies? Um, you, you want to take a whole whole body image of your, your body with a nice face looking at you? Or, um, maybe do you want to m- much more m- m- take some kind of, of um, um, uh, landscape photography underwater? Um, uh, and so... For me, uh, that I really um, adapted my my kind of uh, my, my stuff, my my gear to to this kind of landscape photography. I use I'm using strong strong video lights, a camera with a full frame sensor, and and when you want to take um, a pics of your your bodies, um, nice full body, even face uh, portrait images of your bodies, you can of course use very appropriately um, a nice APS-C camera with, with flashes, with strobes, and that's it. Even when you're doing macro photography, you should um, take care of your camera, you should take care of your optic and, and um, of the special type of strobes or lights which are used there to make this uh, small objects uh, good visible and, and landscape photography is different. So my advice would be uh, look what you want to do and, and um, adapt your uh, configuration to um, this this specific theme and then my my last question for you is uh, I, I, and I'm just just because I'm curious it'll be a, a dry caving question what is one piece of equipment that you will always take with you when you're going dry caving and, and obviously there's like the lights there's certain things but <laughs> what is a what is a, a, a piece of equipment that you found that you use and you're like Every time I go dry caving, I have to take this tool or this thing. It's light and a helmet. That's, that's necessary for dry caving. And even uh, you should even keep in mind uh, where, where the exit can be found. <laughs> <laughs> so there are no main lines. There are no no guiding lines existing in dry caves. And sometimes that can also be a labyrinth. So 
make sure that you know where you can get out and and uh, make sure that you have enough light with you because without light in a dark cave uh, <laughs> you will not find out <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to say maybe like uh, some extra socks or, or uh, uh, you know, like a, a little uh, power bar or something. But no, definitely the, <laughs> the lights. I could definitely see that because, um, yeah, yeah, most people are probably not running lines in dry caves. <laughs> no, <laughs> never found one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be kind of funny to see, I'm sure. Well, Frank, I – Really, really appreciate you coming on to the podcast today. Um, it was great to hear more about your journey, about your photography and and the diving that you're doing. And um, I, I wish you the best of luck getting uh, your son certified. I'm sure he's going to love it. Hopefully uh, he catches the bug. I feel like most people usually do. And uh, uh, maybe maybe I can have him on in the future to kind of hear about his journey through his certification and and you know the the types of dives that he'll be doing soon afterwards. I'm sure he'll he'll probably just catch the bug and start doing a lot of it. So, well done, thanks, Nick. Thanks a lot, and it was a real pleasure to talk to you. And um, well, I'm really looking forward to the outcome of this podcast. Off-gassing, a scuba podcast.